Yes, welcome back to the Magic Sponge Podcast, Miracle Cure for all your rugby league injury issues. I'm Brian. I'm the guy behind NRL Physio and all the content you see on socials. My co-host, James, mate, you are COVID positive as of today, but you're here again, mate. We have just been, I think, in the Sini and the Kurtz household, the, the month of May can just get in the bin because it just wasn't a good a good one on either end. But something I do want to bring up, James, and like obviously our households have been fighting through illness. We're going to talk a lot about the New South Wales guys and, you know, guys getting ruled out and stuff like that. But I'm not sure if you saw the article over the weekend about the Queensland boys having dealt with different tummy bugs in the weeks leading into origin. So not even this week, just... You know, it could have been two, three weeks ago, little tummy bugs. Like, mate, could they be more underdogs? Like, can can you like they're pushing through these tummy bugs, just getting off their deathbeds. It's just crazy to me. I think, like, once again, Queensland just rank underdogs coming in, going down to New South Wales. It just can't get any better for a Queenslander, can it? I don't think so, Brian. I think you've hit a few good KPIs there on the Queensland spirit and the illness and the leader. Of things it really feels like origin is around to start seeing those type of articles doesn't it your point about the sickness stuff god between your family and my family would be like an infectious disease a specialist wet dream at the moment like if they took swabs throughout our house there'd be viruses coming up left right and center for them to analyze so hopefully we get through the, we get through the worst of it soon and we look forward to some some better health but we also look forward to wednesday night and game one down Sydney, I think it's going to be a great game. I, I think despite all the hoopla happening in the lead-up, I think it's going to be really good. Yeah, mate, I think as always the, uh, yeah, the the origin merry-go-round. People ask me, you know, is everyone, do the Queensland media take the piss? Like, do, what happens? And I think it's just like my position on it, again, is just that, you, this week is like unlike no other in terms of media coverage, purely because they just follow the teams around every step of the week. Like if you had, and I think probably the best comparison to it is like the Broncos because the Broncos media just covers them so heavily. Like you hear about all the little niggles and these kind of things. I think niggles, sicknesses, all that kind of stuff happens every week at every club. You just don't hear about it and it doesn't get blown up like it does in origin. Um, and then the funny thing is you get, then you get legitimate. I was talking to someone during the week, you then get like legitimate, medical things happen like i don't know if you remember i think it was over in perth moses and by had like a full-on i think it was like an allergic reaction or something like that and he was in like serious trouble and 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 the queensland doctor did a real good job took after him and getting back from a pretty serious medical incident and it just was like oh bloody queensland <laughs> Like, you know, this, <laughs> this poor guy's had like a full-on medical, almost like a medical emergency. And it's like, uh, oh, classic Maroons, <laughs> which is. Yeah, just yeah. just just been just been a weak dog with anaphylaxis. You know how it is. Yeah. <laughs> the boy who cried wolf uh, coming back to bite him, unfortunately. But uh, yeah. yeah, guys, look, let's get into it. Yeah, we're on YouTube now. So head on over there, uh, search up NRL Physio. Give us a watch. Give us a thumbs up. Subscribe. Uh, really having fun on uh, YouTube, being able to like, yeah, reply to comments and those kind of things, which is always good. Uh, if you get value out of what you hear on here, patreon.com slash journal physio, you know why you're here. We're here to talk about the injuries, loop it back to performance, re-injury risk, and also super coach and fantasy scoring. Uh, if you want any more details, yeah. I mean, just hit my DMs or go to patreon.com slash general physio. Let's get into the injury wrap from round 13 and leading into origin one. I don't know exactly what he's done. I would have thought it was an ankle, but I, I'm just guessing. He shouldn't be out for a long period of time. I mean, I'm, I'm no doctor. We have to wait for the scans, obviously, but that'd be more positive than, than negative. Origin stuff first off the bat here, Brian. So Dylan Edwards was a late rule out this week with a quad injury. So we'll talk about him in a bit of depth, but then also touch on Nico Hines with the calf and Liam Martin with hamstring concerns, respectively. A few little dramas there for the Blues. You hate to see it, don't you? Oh, mate, the Dylan Edwards one is, yeah, like obviously devastating. I think we had Jordan McLean a couple of years ago um, where he got selected and then uh, like to make his debut and then had the hammy in camp, uh, which, and I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think he ever debuted then. Like, you know, he never played for New South Wales, which 
yeah, I mean, that's, that's about as rank as it gets. So hopefully um, that's not the case for Edwards here because, uh, yeah, fair replacement in James Tedesco, someone who we both sort of thought um, New South Wales would have gone with in game one anyway. So, uh, yeah, look, the quad injury, effectively it sounds – quite minor that he did have scans and it showed a minor strain. I think in Michael Maguire's words, it was uh, one, like a minor strain, a one to two week injury. And that was kind of my read on it. Um, you know, from Sat, I think we found out about Saturday afternoon and I sort of said it uh, over on Patreon, it was either going to be the reason they were leaving it to the next day is, is, you know, you get that kind of tightness or that feeling in your quad or whatever it is, quad hamstring, um, you want to leave it to the next day. If it's only minor, see how it pulls up. If it pulls up sore, okay, yep, let's, you know, get it scanned and see what's going on. If you pull up fine the next day, then, you know, it's just a little bit of tightness at the end of a full session. Obviously, he's pulled up a little bit sore the next day. Gone and got a scan. There is a minor strain there. He probably, like, I wouldn't be surprised if he misses this week for Penrith just because they like to, you know, they don't need to rush him back in. They like to take their time with these kind of injuries, these soft tissue things, especially with how Nathan Cleary went recently but i wouldn't be surprised if like he'd suffered that quad strain say last wednesday like four or five days ago or something like that that they still probably wanted to try and get him up to play because they are usually you know pretty good after a week uh but yeah at the at the moment i mean he's looking like a week or two um it'd be two weeks max i'd be thinking if you've got him like i had him in my team and i was happy to trade him out because i'm going to be my super coach team because I'm going to be short on numbers. James, if you're a Dylan Edwards uh, owner in super coach, are you, what are you, are you going to hang on to him? He's been pretty good, but Nathan Cleary, not too far away. What would you be doing with uh, Dylan Edwards at this point? It probably depends on the news, Brian, doesn't it? Like if it's more than two weeks, I'd be moving. I think it's, it's a tough one to say hold, isn't it? He's, he's worth a lot, but Geez, he's banging out some big scores. And I guess the question is, Brian, if New South Wales win game one, surely Teddy plays game two. So maybe Dylan Edwards becomes a hold. I think the outcome of game one is probably the thing that would sway me the most, even if his prognosis was two or three weeks. I think if New South Wales win game one, I would be holding. If they lose game one, I would be selling, would be Probably my early call on it as it stands now. What do you reckon? I like it. I like it a lot. Um, it's probably something – it's definitely something I considered at the time. The thing that got me over the edge to sell him, because spoiler alert, I did sell him this week, was uh, that you no know, 16 and 19 coverage. So I was like, even if he doesn't hold – like even if Teddy – they win game one and Teddy holds the spot – Edwards doesn't do much for me in those major buy rounds. So I only had him for a couple of weeks and then I'm getting rid of him. So I'm a massive tradeaholic. So don't listen to me too much. Uh, then Nico Hines and Liam Martin, both soft tissue, both look like they're playing. Uh, and in terms of re injury risk, I think they're kind of level in that usually I'd say a calf is less likely to re injure than a hamstring. But the fact that this is an already an aggravation for Nico Hines. I mean, we kind of talked about last week about the uncertainty surrounding calf versus concussion, and there still is a few questions in my mind about that considering the way um, that he got up from that knee to the temple. Uh, but, yeah, look, like it, at the moment we're assuming it is purely a calf, and – with that being the case, I think, yeah, there is still moderate, like you, like for Liam Martin, for example, is about a 10 to 12% chance that he's going to re-injure his hamstring. It, historically, we see that over the first one to two weeks. So, you know, it, it, right smack bang in the middle of this origin game. And, and I would consider similar for Nico. So I think both unlikely to back up at this point in time and, um, you know, uh, uh, an increased risk of injury in origin and uh, moving forward over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, nicely somewhere as Brian. So we'll look forward to Wednesday night and seeing how everyone lines up and how everyone goes. From the round 13 by round footy, we've got HIAs to start with firstly. So Trey Fuller and Tom McKayley will have to go through the protocols. I guess Trey Fuller's got the buy coming up, so he could be one who's more likely, although it would probably depend on Hamaso's return as well after origin period. In the Eels versus Sharks, Brian, we've got a few interesting ones to talk about from Para. So Sean Lane with rib concern, but then Bailey Simonson 
with an ACL injury and Ryan Madison, which is what's been reported as headaches or concussion. There are a couple of really interesting scenarios that have sort of unfolded in the last almost day today, haven't they, with, with news coming to light about them respectively? Yeah, they're the they're really interesting ones. So we'll get Sean Lane out of the way first because that's a pretty simple straight up and down. Looked like he suffered a rib injury uh, during the game, came off, was clutching at a rib. Uh, you know, provided there's no fracture there, it's probably just rib cartilage irritation. Moving forwards, uh, we see forwards, particularly middle forwards, which Sean Lane apparently now is one. That's where he played uh, this week. We see their production usually dip between 10 to 20% just purely because of the pain that they're in. So a rib injury like that is something you can needle up, play through, but, yeah, production dips. So, yeah, I, I thankfully sold Sean Lane this week. But, yeah, if, you, if you're a holder, I mean, you probably hold this week because you're low on numbers. But if you're not low on numbers, I'd be moving him on because I'd expect a down turn. Ryan Madison, uh, suffering the headache slash concussion. Uh, well, sorry, headache slash, um, uh, like, yeah, concussion symptoms because we haven't had it confirmed as concussion but effectively i went back and had a look so the article that came out uh, mentioned an incident uh three weeks ago i believe around 10 or he's missed three weeks uh it was the last it was two minutes or, or pretty much the last play he was involved in before he hasn't played since and there is a genuine blow to his head and he stumbles uh, i haven't had chance to post it up on socials yet but i'll try and get it out tomorrow uh yeah he looks dusty as all hell so i i like there's all these conspiracies as soon as it comes with ryan madison just considering his uh like history with clubs and his history with concussion and stuff like that and there's you know been some things where he was really upset with the tigers about the way that they they managed a concussion and then you know, fans are saying it was about contract and all these kind of things. So I, I, I don't want to delve into that too much because it's just all speculation. And I mean, yeah, we don't know anything more than anyone else. But something I have gone and seen is is and can talk on is the concussion or, or the incident. And it definitely looked like a concussion at the time. So reportedly he's still, you know, having headaches. He's he's He has a history of this. You go back 2018, he missed six weeks after a pretty infamous Falcon, uh, you know, got uh, one of the, I think it was a rooster, kicked the ball, hit him in the head. No, he was a rooster, sorry. Uh, hit him in the head and, um, yeah, missed six weeks, was having horrible things. And then 2021, uh, missed four weeks after a concussion as well. We've got three weeks after what I'm assuming is a concussion this time. So it just shows you, I think I always speak about these kind of scenarios, players who have su who have a checkered history with concussion being, yeah, a little bit, a little bit of a concern sort of moving forward, particularly if they have another, you know, another blow to the head. It's why I've shied away from Teddy in the past, uh, you know, Luke Keary, these kind of guys, even Caelan Ponger at times, because yeah, when you have that history of prolonged recovery from concussion, it just increases your risk that this is going to happen again. So when are we going to see him again? Look, this is one that you, how long is a piece of string? It could be next week. It could be, for six weeks from now, uh, people are saying, you know, is, is retirement on the table? Look, like, uh, potentially, I doubt it uh, because that's, you know, the extreme end. But, yeah, just with concussion, you really never know. I think from a super coach perspective, I mean, like, you've got your Cartwright, like Bryce Cartwright um, and uh, Kelma Tuolungi, I think, are the two edges who were this week. I mean, from your perspective, James, I kind of shied away. I thought about Cardi for a bit, and this was like during the week last week um, and before we knew about Maddo. And I was kind of like, oh, Maddo's coming back. Jaman Hopgood's coming back. You've got Sean Lane rolling around. But now we've got Sean Lane dealing with a rib issue. We've got Maddo dealing with this headaches slash concussion issue. I mean, it probably makes Bryce Cartwright a pretty solid buy, hey? Yeah, I'd say so. Um, it's not a super sexy one, and I guess they're not really great on the coverage buy-wise between now and the rest, are they, from the top of my head, oh, I think they've got 19. They do cover 19. They've got 19. So yeah. 19, 19 is a really tough one, actually, to cover. So he might be one closer to 19, maybe, if it's des desperado situation. Um, I don't know what Cardi is off the top of my head, price-wise at the present or... Early fours, I think. Off. 
early fours, early fours and, that's pretty, yeah, it's a bit of a bargain. Mm. Like, if you can lock him into eighty minutes, I think with Mitchie Moses coming back, he could becomes way more attractive on that right edge as well. Not the worst shout. I wouldn't be against it. Yeah, no, that it was just it, there were two guys I kind of looked at and I thought, well, yeah, I I poo pooed them last week, but now I mean, yeah, not the worst buys, and I think Kelma yeah. Tuolangi is pretty cheap as well from memory. So um, he had a low break even. I think he scored pretty well on the weekend, so he might be a bit, bit more expensive. But um, yeah, now Bailey Simonson, this is probably the most interesting topic for the week because in the same article about Madison, we heard. Um, you know, the report was, oh, he had a potential partial ACL tear on the weekend and he's having scans to kind of figure it out. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not really an ice cream man too often, mate. I don't get too many scoops, but I've been told that he's been playing through a partial ACL, uh, excuse me. He's been playing through a partial ACL tear for the past like six weeks, which, yeah, so he went down in the Cowboys game, uh, which was, yeah, I think round six or around there, uh, and came straight off after uh, I've gone back and reviewed the mechanism and it, you know, it's a bit non-contacty. His knee gets stuck in the turf and, and the knee, sorry, his boot gets stuck in, stuck in the turf and his knee kind of goes a little bit, comes straight off the field. He's apparently, he then, and the crazy thing is, and, and this is the, yeah, I guess the mental part of it. He then doesn't miss any time. He he suffers the partial a partial ACL tear, doesn't miss any time. Comes back the next week and runs for 170 meters against the Finns. I think it was, which is you know that's just crazy. crazy. He scored a couple of tries in that time. He then over the weekend, by all accounts, has ruptured the ACL. So the ACL is gone, and it's looking like surgery is going to happen this week. So, yeah, I, I just think obviously it's not really, you know, major breaking NRL news or anything like that. But from a physio perspective, this is about as interesting as it gets for me. And I know talking to you about it, we were kind of, yeah, really fascinated with the case because you've got a guy who suffered a partial ACL tear, which the guys – and and look, I, I'm on record as saying every partial, partial ACL tear can be different. You can have a – a partial ACL tear that's only 10% of the ligament torn and the knee's super loose and it's all over the place. It can also be like 60, 70% torn, but the knee's nice and stable and so it functions really well and those kind of things. Some partial ACL tears need surgery straight away. Others don't need surgery straight away. So they're all over the shop, but pretty much every partial ACL tear that we've seen reported in the NRL in recent times has missed several weeks afterwards for rehab. So we saw, I think your example was Sammy Walker last year. I don't have the number right in front of me, but he missed a good, you know, couple of months with it. Matt Lodge missed at least 10 weeks with it. We've had guys miss less time uh, with more minor ones. And this obviously was a more minor. Um, his knee was obviously, you know, quite stable uh, for him to return the next week and run 170 meters, uh, you know, score a couple of tries in those weeks coming. Just a crazy effort from him to kind of push through that. Really disappointing for him to then, um, obviously go on and and it progressed to a complete rupture so quickly. This was the concern, I think, for myself in terms of when we're talking about Sam Walker last year, we spoke about those stats, 30 to 50% of professional change of direction field sport athletes, professional athletes who have a partial ACL tear that progresses to a full rupture in their career. So, yeah, I mean, We've got a couple of examples now. Matt Lodge, he had the partial. Uh, it, it took three years for his to then, I think it was three or four years for his to progress to a full rupture. Now we've got Bailey, Bailey Simonson, who he's only took six, seven weeks, and it progressed to a full rupture. So, um, yeah, of it, like did the fact that he didn't have time off to rehab, uh, you know, contribute to that? You'll never know, but it, like potentially it could have. Uh, yeah, James, I mean, from your perspective, I, I like, you know, as I said, from a physio, physio wise, this is about as interesting as injury scoops get for me. As I said, it's probably not a breaking of, you know, Nathan Cleary's out for, out for eight weeks and everyone wanted to know that, but certainly a really, a, quite a unique and interesting injury situation here. Hey. Yeah, absolutely. And I think 
Firstly, you've got to say commiserations to Bailey as well. I don't know what the contract status is there for Bailey, whether he's off this year or he's off next year, what that looks like. But, you know, to get an ACL at this point in time in the season, there's also big professional implications with that. So I don't know where that's up to. So hopefully for his sake, he's got some security and some clarity around that moving forward. Because to your point about partial ACL tear, then coming out the very week after running 170 metres and getting some meat, that is insane like that is just crazy to me that he had the ability to do that play through that um speaks volumes to him and i hope he goes through things as well as he can from an acl point of view brian i think there's too much more to add there about bailey's it's just quite a quite a remarkable situation remarkable story and dead unlucky for it to progress that quickly to full acl rupture isn't it no massive props to him i think uh you've summarized it perfectly i uh, i i like to Part of my account is obviously educating people about injuries and just generally understanding what players go through when they suffer injuries. But I think one of the coolest things I really enjoy doing is kind of shining a light on these kind of efforts where it's like he's this guy's been playing through something that like a lot, like the majority of people would not be able to play through from the week after. He's been doing it for the last six weeks and performing really well. Like I, you talk about his contract status. I read that the cows were chasing him, um, you know, over the last week because of his performances this year. Like he's he's been performing yeah. really well. He's 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 looked really really good. So and he's been doing all that reportedly, um, from what I've been told on a on a knee with a partial ACL tear. So yeah, just yeah. huge effort. And once again, like I think we've got a few nominations for a toughest effort of the year or something like that for our end of yeah, year awards. Also. But I think this is this this will be tough to beat. Yeah, it sets the bar very 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 high, Brian. So. What we'll do is we'll move on to the Knights versus Bulldogs here. So Josh Yaddo has a high-grade hamstring injury. Gus Gould has reported that in the ballpark of eight to ten weeks. So that's bad news for Josh Yaddo and the Bulldogs. Uh, from the Knights, Daniel Saifidi with an MCL concern there. I think that was reported as low-grade um, from what I understand, Brian. Is that right? Yeah, it was reported as low to moderate, I think they said. I haven't had a chance to review the footage yet. I Spoiler alert, I did take this weekend to, as the bye weekend to try and uh, like build back up the brownie points that I lost in Magic Round. Uh, so my wife's a bit sick at the moment. Tried to, you know, do some heavy lifting. So I didn't get to see much live footy. So I, a lot of this stuff I've mainly been going back and reviewing. Uh, and Daniel Saifidi's one I haven't got to yet. So, But it has been reported as low to moderate at this point in time, which would be anywhere from kind of two to – four to five weeks. So I'll have more news on that hopefully tomorrow once I get a chance to review that. Uh, Josh Adokar with the hamstring, pretty straightforward here. High-grade hamstring, eight to ten weeks. That's pretty standard. I, like I know I usually say six-plus weeks for a high-grade hamstring. It, it, that's dependent on so many factors. It can be six weeks if it's right in the right spot, you know, that meaty part of the muscle. Um, if you've got a forward who isn't as heavy, you know, heavily reliant on – hamstring, you know, high-end sprinting, those kind of things. But we've got Josh Adokar here who his whole game is so hamstring heavy. Even if it happens in the best spot, you'd, it'd be a miracle for him to be back at that six-week mark just because you've got to dot the I's and cross the T's a little bit, yeah, a little bit more comprehensively with a guy like this. Jason Saab was a really good example earlier in the season where he had one as well. And it's another guy. Yeah. When you when you've got a guy who's reliant on stuff like this, there's extra considerations in that rehab. So yeah, eight to ten weeks is probably about right. And then yeah, re injury risk on return is probably up there as well. Nice one, Brian. Panthers versus Dragons was the next one. Boil over by the Dragons here to get the W. Moses Leota was a hamstring injury out of this one, Brian. I haven't heard anything about grading or severity there. Any news in your neck of the woods? Yeah, no, like nothing as yet. He didn't look overly – like I, I didn't see him – get shot by a sniper by any means. But once again, he is the opposite of Josh Adokar. Like I, Moses Leota is probably one of the quicker front rowers in the comp, but I wouldn't say that, um, yeah, he's heavily reliant on that. So that does work in his favor a little bit. But yeah, he'll, if it's a true hamstring strain, we've seen from the uh, the Panthers in the last week, you know, where they've reported, it's been a bit of this going on from the Panthers actually. And I'll mention that very briefly. Like we had... Um, oh, what's Brad Schneider 
like there, there was an update from we spoke about it last week where uh, from directly from their physio who said oh he's going to miss another couple of weeks with an LCL tear and then he's returned the very next week and only three weeks after suffering what was being called an LCL tear, which is very quick if it is a true, you know, completely torn LCL. And then you had Jack Cole who, uh, you know, Ivan Cleary in the post-match presser was saying he's got a hamstring strain, this kind of thing. And then he's come back the next week and comes out. It's just a, you know, just a precaution. So a little bit of, uh, a little bit of foxing a bit, I think from the Panthers in regards to their injury info more on the lesser end. So we spoke about Nathan Cleary last week about still being in pain and maybe a fair way away. It makes me, you know, dis, a bit more distrusting of that information. Now, potentially he is closer uh, than they're letting on. I'm not sure. So I'm not, yeah, I'm not taking much coming out of Penrith for gospel at this point in time. Yeah, got to trust the sources there. Dolphins v Raiders here, Brian, was the next one. So Cody Kareem was ruled out pre-game with a calf injury. They were the bye. We're assuming he should be back with the round following the bye. And then Jesse Bromwich, a lot of report about this one being a high-grade peck injury. Didn't really look like a peck injury, though, did it, Brian? Do you want to talk about Jesse Bromwich straight off the, straight off the bat here? Yeah, mate. This, um, once again, I'm probably one of the only people who really cares about this, but I get so frustrated. And I know this is a fins, but go back. I think it was like, who was it? I mean, everyone saw me lose my mind at Adam Reynolds being ruled out for the season on the spot by the telecast when it just was never really an option. Um, so it's not just a fins thing, I promise. Uh, but like Jesse Bromwich, once again, I missed this game. I, like I think if I'd have been watching this game, I would have like bashed my phone through the wall tweeting so hard, seeing like this graphic flash up at halftime, being like Jesse Bromwich suffers potential career-ending pectoral injury. That is just mental to me, mental when the only indication was he's in a bit of pain and he's touching his chest. Like there is, there is so many things because if you look at the mechanism, nothing about that points to peck. Like there, there was nothing in that that makes anybody who's seen a peck injury before. And we've seen commentators do a really good job of that. I remember Tom Trebojevic in, in origin last year, like he had that classic peck injury mechanism and whoever was on the call was like, Oh, like he's probably done his peck. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Because that is a classic peck mechanism as obvious as it gets. Whereas here, there was nothing, there was nothing. He's clutching his chest to have something up saying like potential career ending. And this is coming from a guy who I've copped crap from clubs in the past about, you know, ruling players out for X number of weeks when I put up my general recovery timeline. So I get it. Like I probably dance the line a little bit too at times. And so it's a bit ironic coming from me. But, yeah, to have that up, that was wild. When I went back and reviewed that game, I could not believe it because by all accounts of my little sources, the uh, – the Dolphins had a fan day today and quite a few people messaged me and said that they had a chat to Jesse and he had scans last night. So that's Saturday night. And it is a rib injury, which is exactly what it looked like on the telecast. It looked like it, it reminded me a lot of the Jock Madden injury that we spoke about a few weeks ago, which was pretty similar. It was reported as a pec injury. Wasn't reported as a season ender though, um, or a career ender. Um, but it was a contact mechanism and ended up being a high up rib injury. And my first look looking at the Bromwich thing was, yeah, rib slash sternum because of the way that he went down and he got squashed. So look, I think Jock Madden missed like two or three weeks. That's probably about, you know, worst case, uh, if there's like a fracture there or something like that, those higher up rib injuries can be a little bit tougher to get on top of because they are a bit tough, uh, a bit tricky with their rehab. But yeah, mate, I, like I know I'm ranting and I've gone on for ages about something which, you know, I'm sure not too many people care about. But yeah, I just find that really frustrating that like, yeah, to put something up like that, in, in, you know, graphic there and, and the comms were going on, even when it came out, it, they, like the Dolphins reported potential rib injury. I think the commentary was saying they didn't believe it. It was like, oh, I don't believe that. They're, they're foxing. And I was like, go back and look at how the injury happened. Like, my God. So, I don't know. 
I'm ranting, mate, but yeah, you can cut me off and and we <laughs> can move on. But I don't know whether it frustrated you even a ten percent as much as as me. But yeah, I just didn't like it. No, I um, didn't really have the mental capacity to invest too much into it, to be honest, Brian, with the current status of my health. So I just let it wash over me like a gentle <laughs> wave in the ocean. I just let it wash and I moved on to next things to try and keep me and my family alive onto the next thing. Um, last game of the round, Brian, we're going to move forward. So Jared Ware Hargraves was a reported as a hamstring injury. He was sort of off and on with this anyway. It doesn't look like it's anything major. He might be sitting down for a few weeks with a high shot anyway, I'd imagine. Yeah, I think they just said that it was precautionary, mostly tightness. He's had that many hamstring issues over his career to the point where I think he might have like an ongoing lower back thing that kind of leaves him susceptible to pain in his hamstrings and calves that might not actually be, you know, true strains. It might be more that referred pain from the back potentially. So, yeah, he, he might be missing longer with a suspension than he is with an injury. Patreon questions now, Brian. So as usual, patreon.com forward slash NRL physio. This is where you get the questions answered week to week. Let's rip into tonight's, Brian. So first one from Patreon is, what do you think the chances are of Reese Walsh or and or Payne Haas backing up from Origin? The Bronx get a four-day turnaround, um, I guess, factoring in knee issues there. What do you think about Reese Walsh, Payne Haas? And I guess we can talk generally about Origin backup stuff as well, can't we? Yeah, I think this is a good opportunity to talk about just generally who we, like guys we think are unlikely to back up. I think Haas and Walsh are probably unlikely. It's only a four-day turnaround for them. They've bo both been dealing with knee issues. Walsh particularly, I think last time he played, it will have been 10 days since he played. So that's some good time to get some recovery into you. But I, I thought in that game against the Titans, he looked pretty proppy at times like he 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 you know go and sprint and, and do something amazing but then he'd kind of be limping around a little bit or just look restricted whether that was like really tight strapping on his knee not exactly sure but yeah I'd just be surprised particularly with Haas um looking at that New South Wales team I think surely he plays pretty big minutes in the middle as like their alpha dog, uh, particularly now that Freddie's gone and Freddie always had those weird like minutes distributions where he'd just play guys for like, you know, like he'd play pain ass for like 30 something minutes. I'd be like, what the hell? Like surely Hass is playing 50 plus minutes. I just can't see how he then will back up considering he's, he's got this knee issue that he's managing. Walsh is a little bit more of a chance because they don't have Tristan Saylor, uh, there, but I think maybe Selwyn Cobbo goes back and plays fullback because he's just coming off the bench and that Carapani's looked really good in the centres for the Bronx. So I think that's probably the more likely scenario. I think Nico's pretty much no chance uh, coming off his calf. I think Liam Martin's probably close to no chance. And then the only other two that I looked at from an injury perspective, uh, I haven't looked at the turnarounds of but obviously the guys who are like three, four-day turnarounds are a bit less likely. But Murray Taolungi and Xavier Coates have both only just come back from hamstring issues as well, so they're probably unlikely just for the, with the loading and stuff like that. Have I? You think I've covered most of them there, James? Yeah, I believe so. I was trying to think of other New South Wales players off the top of my head, but I can't really think of anyone. You know, maybe you can make an argument. Well, Tedesco's at the bye, so probably not even then. I can't really make an argument for too many more people than that, to be honest, Brian. So I think we've we've ticked most of them off. But then, you know, there's always going to be things that come out of the game, isn't there, where people are going to sit and miss. And I think in recent seasons, we've seen the pattern of clubs being quite conservative with players, especially after Origin 1. Once it gets to Origin 2 and 3, push might come to shove there, so to speak. But after Origin 1, I, I can't recall the exact stats from last year but i can't remember there being heaps and heaps and heaps of people back up on on the weekend there it, unless they played like you know limited minutes i suppose we've seen a few people back up from from that respect i guess ben hunt's a classic or the genre there who seems to get trotted out by the dragons week after week um but i guess that just comes with the territory sometimes doesn't it? if you're on the big bickies the expectation is that you've got to front up if you're if you're able to do so question number two brian is about cody ramsey could he realistically return to the nrl at some point there was some stuff on the socials about him getting around the training paddock with the dragons geez it looks like he's lost some um i guess size and physical conditioning hasn't he with that battle with inflammatory bowel disease 
Oh, man, he looks like a different person, which, you know, with yeah. with these kind of medical issues, especially medical issues of the severity that he has, uh, yeah, to be expected. I think the key here is just like, and you probably deal with this stuff a lot more than me uh, being, you know, working in a hospital. But I think it's just really important for people to understand that like these medical issues, like uh, the ulcerative colitis is an inflammatory bowel disease at the end of the day, medical issues just affect everyone differently. So, you know, you can have people who need to have like significant surgery for this and are just like so affected day to day. Uh, You can also have, you know, more minor cases of this and it it doesn't affect you too much so the one example or recent example that i think you know some people might have heard of or might have exposure to is jake waterman um in the afl he pays for the west coast eagles he missed six months with it last year but is back playing this year exact same he has ulcerative colitis he um lost i think he lost 12 kilos he said at the time uh, has put it back on, is on daily medication and then gets like infusions of more significant medication once every couple of months. Uh, but yeah, that that's the thing to emphasize here is that it's not something where you can get cured from and then you it's kind of something you have to learn to play with and understand because like dietary wise, he's got to figure out his diet. He's got to figure out how his body responds to all those different medications that he's on, how that deals with training. Like it's a whole, it's such a complex thing. He's got to try and put size back on while dealing with the medic, medical issues that he's dealing with. So yeah, it's yes, he could realistically return to the NRL at some point, but I've, I think I've said it once already this uh, podcast. But how long is a piece of string? You just don't know. It, it could end up anywhere. I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll throw to you as somebody who probably deals with these kind of um, you know multifaceted issues and and certainly medical issues a lot more. But yeah, it, it, it's it's surely just a very varied um, issue that could end up anywhere. Hey, yeah, it's really hard to know. Um what the management's been up on to now, what the management's going to be moving forward. Um, but certainly, I guess, the amount of reconditioning he's going to have to do. And that's, I guess, when you're talking to people physio-wise or across the allied health spectrum, like a lot of what we do with people after prolonged hospital admissions is physical reconditioning, rehabilitation, that sort of thing. So I guess for people playing along at home, why it's important to not spend long periods of time in bed if you're in a long-term hospital situation with long-term health concerns, it's there's some research that shows like i think it's something like two weeks of bed rest is the same as 10 years of age related muscle like decline so it happens quick so like when if you're immobile if you're inactive changes in your body happen really really quickly that are detrimental long term and in nrl where you need to be physically conditioned to kill like that's your kryptonite is is immobility inactivity not being able to perform certain things um, to certain intensities that Cody would have had to be, you know, managing through that time. So I guess all we can do is wish him all the best getting back there. Brian, I guess realistically, God, if you had to put your money somewhere, you'd probably bet against, but it's just going to be a time thing more than anything else will reveal itself here, I reckon. Yep, totally agree. Last or second last question, sorry, Brian, is um, are you able to explain what a sports hernia or adductor strain is and the significance that the injury has on performance? This is particularly about Corey Horsborough, who's been out now for, I think, eight weeks and counting with a groin injury without any real sign of return or signs of a return date from the Raiders there. Do you want to just explain to us about sports hernia um, and then adductor strains? Because they're sort of a separate thing, aren't they? Yeah, so uh, like I think we can pretty safely assume that it's a sports hernia at this point because I don't like the adductor strain is just a groin strain, which we've seen in in guys like Cameron Munster and these kind of guys. So it can affect you quite significantly. But a sports hernia, effectively, like a hernia, is a separation of the muscular tissue, and then you get effectively what is your intestines or your internal organs kind of just poke their head out a little bit through that little split in the um in the muscular tissue uh that happens in a sports hernia in the groin um so kind of the crease of your groin sort of down if you if you're a big uh y front undie wearer james where the the edge of your undies uh ride on um the, as the, you should be brian <laughs> as well <laughs> oh man the the issue with 
a sports hernia and with any groin or lower abdominal issues is it is an area. It's a bit like a rib injury in a way in that it's just an area that you use so much as a footy player. So if you've all of a sudden got this niggling issue that causes pain when you twist, when you turn, when you change direction, when you go to accelerate, when you go to decelerate, it's just there all the time. Like I, I I've heard of it described as like the mosquito injury. It's like the mosquito that's buzzing around your head and you just can't seem to like, you can't seem to get on top of it. Um, Michael Morgan's a pretty infamous one who he had one of the worst seasons of his career playing through a sports hernia. Um, I think until he might've been the year he did his bicep as well. And then he could finally got fixed up or, or something that might not be right. But yeah, I do remember he had one of the worst seasons of his career playing through one. It's just in an area that affects so many different movements that you do. So Corey Horsburgh, for me, even in a draft capacity, maybe if you've got – we've got a question very soon about um, late-season injury, comeback candidates, but there's plenty of other guys. Even though Corey Horsburgh probably returns before a lot of them, so he's probably a good chance of returning in the next month. But, yeah, performance-wise, it's just someone who they'd have to be – not many options out there on the waivers uh, for you to stash him. I mean, where are you at on Corey Horsburgh? Are you kind of on the similar wavelength? Yeah, I think Raiders depth is the other one here, Brian, as well. I think last year he had some really good scores there playing sort of front row minutes or middle minutes, but I think that's a fair bit of depth there this year. Um, they're not losing many to the origin period either. Obviously, Morgan Smithies has come across, been a big minute player. I don't look at him as someone that I'm going to stash, to be brutally honest. Um, in the fantasy realm, Brian, do you like Mitch Moses or Clint Gutho as buyers now that they look pretty good last week in their return from their respective injuries? Um, I don't mind Moses. I think I sort of said um, the main concern with Moses is re-injury risk. There are some performance concerns with a fifth metatarsal fracture, particularly for a guy who changes direction, but we saw him the other night. He looked fantastic. It's mainly just the re-injury risk. It's 20%. Um, and the, and in that's in professional athletes. So that's pretty high. Um, so I like rolling the dice with him. If you're looking for a downgrade from, uh, from Nico Hines, for example, he's a guy who will cover 19 unless he gets called in origin. Like that's the other thing I think people aren't, um, yeah, are underestimating is there might be a really good chance that if he plays like he did the other night and New South Wales lose game one, there's a red hot chance that Moses is there for game two for sure. Uh, Gutho's just a no go for me. I mean, fullback is a spot where there's so many options, so many good options. Uh, and even with guys like, you know, Dylan Edwards going down, I just would not be touching Gutho purely because you just don't know. He looked good the other night, but you don't know what his knee's going to be like in four weeks. So for me, I just, yeah, no, thank you. I think there's other options at fullback as well. Like you said, Brian, there's even, there's a few goal kickers knocking about there. So I think you probably want to look, look that way and, and spend your money that way. Lastly, on the Super Coach front here, Brian. Any good late season injury comeback candidates? I think someone was mentioning maybe an Adam Dewey scenario or a Campbell Graham scenario, just for sort of stashing deep in your bench in draft formats more so than anything else. Yeah, I think Campbell Graham's an interesting one. I've been told he's aiming for around around twenty return, uh, but if the bunnies aren't looking good, that they're probably just going to shut him down for the season, which I think is probably the smart move. So. I mean, I don't know whether the Bunnies can turn it around. Trell is back, so whether he can kind of turn things around, I hope so for my uh, Supercoach team. But, yeah, I Campbell Graham's not one I'm super high on in CTW because CTW already you've got plenty of high upside guys there. Dewey I don't mind because I think he's kind of spoken about coming back in uh, to play halfback, which I think is probably the one position where – the Tigers could use someone at the moment. They're kind of, you know, been chopping and changing between between a few different guys. He's also a really good goal kicker and like all props to Appy Corusau, he's probably not the, mm. you know, most solid. So yeah, Dewey, I don't mind. He's aiming for a turn in a, like in the next 
four to six weeks pretty much. So he's obviously going to come back through New South Wales Cup. They're not going to throw him straight in the top grade, but he's someone I don't mind. I mean, I have, I do have one absolute train wreck of a draft comp. It's a keeper league where I'm just so bad. So I just gave up this season knowing that it's a keeper league. And I've brought in every injured person under the sun. My whole, I, I think I've got one, two, three, four, five scoring players and all the rest are like upside, just stashes, <laughs> which is pretty intense. But the two that I have there that I'm probably most excited about from like a, particularly a final standpoint is if anyone dropped like an Adam Reynolds or a Jamal Fogarty, uh, just with like at halfback, which is a pretty shitty position, uh, particularly with Cleary down, Nico, no good. I don't mind those guys um, because you don't know, like Cleary could come back and hurt his hamstring again. So I think having someone like Reynolds or Fogarty, who you know is going to be there from around 19, 20, 21 and be there for finals. Uh, biceps doesn't have a high risk of re-injury. I, I like those stashes. They're probably two who I look at. Mate, you're uh, probably a better drafter than me um, on some weeks, maybe not others, but have you got any in your head that you're kind of looking to stash? No, I couldn't think of any when we talked about this off air, Brian. I think you've hit the ones from a seven perspective, which I like. Tom Flegler is the one that's a little bit unknown. I think there'd be minutes there at the Dolphins if he could get the shoulder right. We haven't really heard too much more about that situation though. So it doesn't look like it's any closer to him getting back on the field. Yeah. Well, I mean, Jesse Bromwich uh, is fake. outside of those two. I'm, I don't really think so. I, I suppose AJ Brimson was a high grade groin. Um, but I don't think he would have been dropped by draft rosters. I wouldn't assume. Um, who else has been sort of a long-term injury that might've been dropped recently? Oh, well, no, no, I, yeah. I don't think. No, no, I like, think, I think, I think you've, we've hit all the good ones there. I think like Kalen Pong is a really good buy. If there's anyone out there who's, mm -hmm. you know, like not doing well and has Kalen Pong sitting on their bench, obviously go out and try and buy him. Cause I think, um, yeah, I like him. Obviously, probably not. There are some performance implications coming back off of Liz Frank. But uh, yeah, I think if you can get him a bit cheaper, like maybe like around three or four price, I would be jumping all over that. Uh, speaking of super coach, mate, hit me with your score this week. Uh, mate, bloody good week for you. Um, so hopefully uh, I've climbed a few ranking spots there. And then how, look, we're about halfway through super coach. We've used probably three quarters of our trades. So what are you looking to do this week? So this week, um, no trades for me. So I um, withheld my impulsive need to trade. And I banked some, um, well, didn't bank them. I just didn't use my three trades, to be honest. So this score this week is 988. Weirdly, I had um, Armstrong and Tungo not in my best 15, and I tried to VC Tungo. I just think he's due for a try sometime soon. But anyway, he didn't see any meat the other night, which was sad for me. Um, also, sadly, I had Captain Joey Manu. I thought as soon as he was named fullback, I thought, yep, he's the safest bet out of all the roosters I had and also Scotty Drinkwater, but that wasn't to be. So I don't know about 988 where it'll sit, Brian. I, I don't think I'll see too many green arrows there. I, I don't know. I think there'll be people that captain someone better, though I don't think I'll see sort of massive jumps there up the rankings, to be honest. In terms of my plan, so round 14, I've got 750 in the bank. <sighs> If Queensland win, I feel like Dave Fafita's got to come in. It'll be either him or Elie Katoa. So that's trade one. Trade two is Trey Fuller to a Latrell Mitchell to a Greg Marzi Vice centre wing or maybe a Jareem Buller. I still keep sort of eyeing off Jareem Buller or a Samuel Finu from the Tigers. I feel like the Tigers are weird, mate. Like, I don't know if they're undervalued. It might be a really shit take. I don't really know. But the Tigers lose pretty much nobody to origin. Can they – and they play every single game between now and round 26, I think. I don't think they buy until round 26 again. So I just wonder if they can be really serviceable through this period. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I'm an idiot there or if I'm galaxy braining it. I, I don't really know how to, how to sort of size that up. But I think there probably is value in the Tigers players through this next little period of time. In terms of this week, I probably am going to take the auto emergency because I've got Nico Hines and Sam Walker at seven. So I'll probably have to think of trading Nico next week and Angus Crichton next week. So 
Jerome Hughes or Maxi Platt are in mind, but they're probably more like a week 15 sort of scenario there, especially if Max Platt doesn't play next week, so he doesn't give me an extra number. And then from round 15, I think Jermaine Asako is definitely on the menu there, Brian. He's shed a bit of cash. I think he's right for the picking. He covers some good buys. He's got a good ceiling. The fins are going well. I think he's one of the center wings you probably need to have in your final teams, and I think he can he can be in there from round 15, I'd say, as well. So I guess, like, the next four is probably, yeah, like a Fafida, Katoa, probably Latro Mitchell, I would say, and a uh, Jermaine Asako would probably be, be my plan or a Maxi Platt. They're probably in the next four or five trades, and then I think I should be reasonably settled. So um, I've, I'm in a pretty good spot where I've got a fair bit of money to play with. So I can trade almost, I might even be able to enough someone up to for feeder, which is crazy um, at this point in the year where I can just keep a few guys who are playing like a Brennan Piacura, even like he's not going to score you huge points, but there might just be a week that I need him as a number. And if he can just bag me 40, then I'll, I'll be pretty happy about that rather than trading him up to for feeder. I might be able to trade like a Joe Chan or a Paisa Farmasuli. You know, that'd be a pretty good move just to get an extra number in for multiple weeks, I think is how I've sort of summed up the team there. But I think, out of the fullbacks, Brian, I guess Latrell's probably the one, isn't he? I know you sort of brought him in this week um, because of the Teddy shenanigans, but I, I don't see anyone else being more attractive than him through this period of time either. Like, I think Latrell's the one to have, in my opinion. Yeah, I think the only thing that'll stitch him up is if New South Wales lose game one and then, yeah, like, surely they bring him in. I don't in. know. Well, I don't know. Like, just Madge stick with his guys? I guess it depends how, like, if it's a close loss, does he go, no, like, you know, I, I, like, I picked these guys because I picked them. Like I, like, I wasn't planning. I was planning to move to Latrell after seeing how the game went this week um, because I wanted to kind of roll with Latrell and Teddy through the origin period if New South Wales won game one was my thoughts. I thought that would just be an electric combo, obviously. So I traded in Teddy. Then by the time we got the Teddy news, I couldn't, like, uh, well, I didn't want to reverse back to Edwards because I thought he'd be ruled out and I'm going to be quite short next week. I think I've only got 16 or 17 players max and some of those are real scrubbers. So... Yeah, I just went Edwards to Latrell. Effectively, is what I went. Uh, I spoke on this podcast about not trading this week, and then I made three, which is not a shock for me, being the tradeaholic that I am. I just identified. I looked at my team, and I, I saw that I was really short on round nineteen numbers, and I was really worried about Lane being named on an edge and losing cash. So I went Lane to Nicara. Um, I kind of toss up Nicara or. Um, uh, Bryce Cartwright, as I said, I went with Nicara, and I think Nicara lost as much cash as Sean Lane did. But anyway, what can you do? I did bring Armstrong in for low max, which is the one trade that I kind of planned. And then I was going to bring in Teddy just purely because I think on the bye weeks, I think we spoke about it. I like to have like the highest upside guy and captain him because I think that can make a big difference in a week that, you know, usually you're not going to see too much movement, as you said, even with a good score. So, yeah, that kind of just stuffed me around and made me use probably one more trade than I wanted to, but I'm happy with Latrell. He's going to be really good over the next couple of weeks for sure. My only real target, I'm only at like 16 trades, so I've got little to no trades, but it's okay because my team is looking really good. Um, my only real targets are Ellie Katoa and Dave Fafita and maybe an upside center wing who plays around 19. So Ronaldo Mulatalo is looking really good. Like he is, he'll be sub 500 or really close to sub 500 this week. And I think he's still got like a 70 odd break even. So I'm pretty happy to sit him or sit and not bring him in this week and wait till Nico's back potentially or something like that. Uh, Mulatalo looks good. Asako, as you said, looks good. Tolatau Kula and Mike Asivo, I think, is the other one if the Eels are kind of back on a little bit. One, to your point, I love your Tigers call. I think you, I think most teams should be aiming to have two or three Tigers in their side over this period. I don't think that's a hot take because I think one of them is going to be Lockie Galvin. I think he's a great play. And then the other one, I think Samuel Afainu with um, – Johnny Bateman and now uh, Isaiah Papali'i out for 
you know, the next eight weeks, he's just locked into an 80 minute role. He looked really good the other day as well. The other one, I think keep an eye on, he was someone I was eyeing off as potentially an early bring in, but I didn't cause I just don't know his role, but uh, Matamua who was named to start at lock, but then I think he went back to the bench, but he looked really good last game and scored, I think maybe mid forties off the, uh, oh, I think he was off the bench, um, but he's only like 234K and he'll be due for a price rise this week. So I think he's an, Excellent, excellent downgrade for someone like I've still got Joe Chan sitting there who even with like the Storms outs over Origin, I don't know if he's going to get a game. So I'm like, do I? It seems like a bit of a sideways move. But if I can get Matamua, if he is somehow wins that starting lock role and punches out like, you know, 45, 50 every week on those tough weeks, that is gold for a 234K guy which, as you said, you know, at a pinch, you just play him and you'd bank the points. So I don't mind him, but really the way I'm looking at it, the only other consideration i got is do I trade Nico out, but I think I'm going to try and hold Nico because I don't want to have to try bring back in Nico and Cleary with my limited trades. I don't mind the Nico trade out. It's just I've only got 16 trades. I'm sure everybody out there has like 20 or more. So, um I think if I – I've kind of got it in my head, four more trades, and I should pretty much have my team that I like until Cleary's back, really, and that's when I want Cleary. So that'll give me like 12, 11 or 12 trades to run home with, um, you know, bring back in Cleary, get another gun fullback if Luttrell's out. So I think I've got a plan in my head. Realistically, I'll probably just keep trading like an absolute madman until I've got like four trades left and then just try and – ask my way through but i don't know this is the way i enjoy playing so why not it's uh it's good fun what are your thoughts there james i mean out of those four mulatalo asako cooler and sivo i know you've said asako he is probably going to be a little bit more expensive than those guys so maybe if we say asako is probably ranked first who would you like the most out of mulatalo cooler and sivo going forward Probably Mike Sivo fourth. I would say, oh, geez, but he also actually is shaping up all right. It's just hard because Sivo is so try dependent, but then Mulatalo is as well to a point. So I think they're much of a muchness. I probably like Cooler at two there. I think he's, even with the AC, I think you're willing to take a risk with him being a fullback. Because I think anytime you can get a fullback in your center wing, that's worth a lot in, in the way things are set up to score because their base is just so safe. Their floor is so safe. So. I'd probably go Sucker one, cooler two, and then Multalo Sivo, I'd coin flip for the third, I reckon. I like it, mate. That's pretty much what I got in my head too. I think I want to bring Jermaine in. It'll just be dollars will be the only thing that'll keep me from mm-hmm. it. So whether I have to go down to – because Mulatalo, Cooler, I'm not sure on Sevo's price actually, but I know Mulatalo and Cooler are down that little bit around 500K, which for – like as you said, the one who I'm probably going to trade is – um. Uh, Tungo from the Panthers, mate. Yeah. He is just like – I brought him in. He's been my worst trade this year by far. Like I'm doing okay in the rankings. I think I'm somewhere between 1 and 2K. Um, so made some good moves this year, but by far he's been my worst. I brought him in as a point of difference. I think I brought him in because six – it was like – it was the week that Cleary came back, and I didn't want to bring in Cleary, but I was like, oh, well, I'll offset that by bringing in – Tungo, who has scored like five tons in his last 10 games with Cleary. So I'm like, you know, that's great. What a trade in at 700K. He's like 500K now, and it's been absolute dirt. So, yeah, look, misery loves company. I'm sure there's plenty of people listening who've made horrible decisions as well, but that is by far my worst because, yeah, he has lost me 200K, scored shit. I brought him in for round 13. He scored 30-something points. So, yeah, Mm. we've all got, got those stories, I'm sure. Yeah, we do. Yeah, he was in, he was funnily, like of all the players that I had, he was in my lower scoring. So him and David Armstrong, which is quite funny to think about, isn't it? When you, when you weigh it all <laughs> up, but yeah, it's going to get interesting soon, mate. I think there's a few big moves to be made. I'm not super stoked with where my team is at, but I guess if you can just keep finding the right captain week to week, it just keeps your head above water just for a little bit longer. Um, and I've been pretty lucky on that front up until this week with Joey Mano. I really just left points on the table there. I had it on Sammy Walker right up until kickoff and I just should have backed my gut because I just had a feeling Sammy was due for a few tries. And I I thought they were going to put a score on 
the Cowboys today, but anyway, it wasn't to be. That was a, there's been some weird old results this week as well, by the oh, way. Mate, like, my work tipping comp, I got one out of five. Yeah. I'm one of yeah. only two people to get one. Everyone else got zero. Crazy. <laughs> Crazy. They weren't actually bad games either. Like, no. I know everyone rags around by around footy and origin interrupted things. But it's not perfect. You just got to live with it every year. It is what it is. I, I think there's plenty of other things you can you can get around as part of it. Um, but the crown jewel is Origin Brian, and that's on Wednesday. So aim up for that. Get yeah, keen. mate. I'm keen. I'm keen. That's it for us guys. Uh, James, mate, another solid mate. You don't. You sound good. You're COVID positive, but you're pushing through, mate. It's good to see. I hope it doesn't hit you hard for Wednesday, and you can enjoy a huge victory to the underdog Queenslanders, mate. You know, dealing with tummy bugs a month ago. Uh, like, how how are they getting up for Origin when they had a, a oh, they upset tummy four weeks ago? It's just crazy to me. I like, oh mate, they yeah, couldn't be just, more underdog. Just wait until the just wait until the lead up, Brian. They'll just be dropping natural disasters in there, <laughs> doing it for the people of Queensland. Billy Slater will start rattling off poetry. It's like, it's such a good ham up. I love it. It's, I love just love the G up. It's good. There's I nothing did. Better, honestly, God, I lost it the other day. Like, it, it just becomes like part of the normal vernacular now, but. Like Vossi pointed it out, I think, on one of his breakfast shows where he was like, Billy, like that. Someone asked Billy, like, how did David Fafita take the the phone call? And he's like, oh, he took it like a true Queensland. Yeah. <laughs> so good. You just like, and Vossi was like, what does that even mean? That means nothing. Yeah. <laughs> it means everything. That's the, that's the best thing about it, Brian, is it means everything. Oh, Every time I talk man. to you, my wife goes, oh, how's, how's Brian going? I was like, oh. He's just like a true Queenslander. He's having the best time. <laughs> oh, mate. Oh, it's so on. good. And Iron that's flag. what makes – it. doesn't it just make origin? Like, I don't know, from a Queensland perspective, the G up is half of it. It's so good. Oh, but, yeah, um, give me give me a tip, James. Who and by how many? Um, I am going to say – I think it's going to be a really low-scoring game. I've got Queensland like 12-10. Like, I think it's just going to be a really – I think it's going to be a bit of a bludger of a watch. I think it's just going to be a bit, a bit of a grindy footy match. I think it'll probably be a little bit slow. It's normally it's sort of a typical Sydney game as well. It's always a bit of went underfoot. Um, I think man of the match will be just one of our one of our boys. I think Paddy Carrigan will be man of the match. I think he'll play sort of high sixty, low seventy minutes. He'll be everywhere. He'll be doing everything. Um, I think he's probably the one that will get us across the line off the back of a huge effort there. He's already, like, demonstrated how good he is in that arena. Um, he's been that good for the Broncos this year, um, almost under the radar good, like, but he's just elite. He's he's such a good player. So it's, that's why I see it going. I think just a little bit of um, experience in the Queensland team as well gets us home across the line. A few fresh faces for the Blues will be good for them early. But, um, yeah, I think that's, that's where we'll sort of end up um, at sort of like a 12-10 sort of score line. I just... Can't see big points in this one. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but I just can't see it. No, I'm the same, mate. Low scorer, Queensland by four. Man of the match, I am going to go. Let's just go full on heel and say it'll be Reese Walsh. He'll light it up. Uh, and, yeah, why not? Uh, all right, guys. Enjoy the week. Enjoy Origin. As always, hopefully not too many injuries out of Origin. And, uh, yeah, we'll come back and hit you next week with post-Origin wash-up and post-Round 14 wash-up. And, as always, up the mighty, mighty Redcliffe Dolphins and the Queensland Maroons. It's a 